couple quick housekeeping announcements. Everyone, take out your phone and please make sure that it's silent. I'll wait. <laughs> Uh, while you do that, um, uh, we do need to uh, comply with the fire code, so if you're standing against the wall, please start making your way towards the seat. And today, we are truly blessed. And I do mean that literally, because our guest is a spiritual pioneer, <laughs> selflessly serving as a Comte the First in the Holy Taco Church. When he's not spreading the good news of the warm comfort of a delicious taco, uh, shared with brands or the, the cool, refreshing, calming power of a chilled margarita, uh, he also occasionally writes books. <laughs> Author of the Iron Fruit Chronicles and the Star Wars Heir of the Jedi, please help me welcome Kevin Byrne. <laughs> but before we begin, we have a special event. Oh my! <laughs> That's the wrong one. That's the Imperial March <laughs> Oopsie! We do have a plum trooper. Mr. Hearn. Yes! In appreciation of your contributions to the Star Wars legacy, you are welcome as an honorary member of the Rebel Legion. Yeah! Fan <laughs> organization. Awesome! Thank you so much! Space material. <laughs> and, uh, it, it is. Uh, it, it says, "Okay, I appreciate your contribution to Star Wars legacy." Kevin Hearn is welcome. Yes, as an honorary member of the Rebel Legion fan organization, and this says Rebel Legion, and this says things in another language. It, says Rebel Legion. <laughs> it also says Rebel Legion in, 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 in funny letters. I mean, great letters, great letters. And, and uh, yeah, it, it's fabulous looking. Thank you so much. This is so cool. And then um, this is a uh, an honorary member, author, Rebel Legion, and then Rebel Legion on the other thing too. And uh, is this an insignia, like an a indicator yes. of rank? Yes. Cool. I have a rank. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is three red dots and three blue dots. <laughs> and uh, this is really serious. I did not expect this at all. So thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate it. Magnetic. So I have to figure out how, to, how it works. Aha! Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. There you go. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sometimes it's magic. Does that mean magic. the rest of you is Commander Hearn for the rest of the panel? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I don't think I raised that for you. That's what the three red dots and the three blue dots mean. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Even if they're not, I think we just feel through it as you. Yes. I'm pretty sure the audience has spoken. I have got it. So, Commander Herb. Yes. <laughs> we will take questions from the audience here shortly. But yeah. uh, to get started, since you have now been inducted into the Star Wars realm, yeah. what does it take to write a story for Star Wars? Whoa, well, well that's loud. Um, <laughs> when, when I was a, a wee lad, uh, I don't know how many of you are Phoenix natives and might remember the uh, Seneca Pre. Yeah. So I was seven years old when Star Wars came out, and uh, I saw, you know, the Imperial destroyer coming out of the top. Going, pew pew pew! What's that ship and who's on it? And it, it I was just immediately captivated, and saw it a bunch more times after that on Arizona's largest screen. And uh, after that. I'm this little guy, you know, and, and, I, and I got the action figures for Christmas. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, it, we got an X-Wing, we got a TIE Fire, and the Millennium Falcon, we're having a good old time, you know, making up stories right there. Um, and then, of course, you know, having the eight-year-old prepubescent boy voice trying to do James Earl Jones, that <laughs> is a good time. <laughs> You know, you, in your mind, you're trying to show a part, trying to watch her alive, and it's like, tear the ship apart, tear the ship apart! But but I had so much fun, uh, you know, playing in that universe uh, from the get-go, 
And then when the Empire Strikes Back came out, I was, uh, I think I was, uh, I might have been 12, um, because it was 1982, is that right? So uh, yeah, I, I was 12 years old when that came out, and I, I'm sitting there watching Luke Skywalker hang upside down in the wall of the cave, and he summons the lightsaber to his hand. I'm like, whoa, how did you learn how to do that? And, and it, it kind of bugged me it, it, for a very, very long time. And then Del Rey called me up one day, or actually they emailed me, and asked if I would like to write the story of Luke Skywalker right in between, you know, episode four and five. And I was like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it was precisely, I mean, I, mean I, I grew up to write the story of the hugest question in my head when I was a kid. And so that was the coolest thing ever, uh, uh, to be able to talk about how Luke grew in the Force uh, in between those two movies when Ben Kenobi was dead and um, he hadn't met Yoda and uh, you know hologram Ben Kenobi wasn't really a major part of that so uh, he had to learn somehow and that was kind of the fun of it. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Did it? I think that was a great answer. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Take it. I just kind of ramble when this happens so correct me if I need redirection. Oh, I got a box too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Right, do we have questions for Commander Herb? Well, can, I, can I say a couple things first? Oh, absolutely. Just randomly, and then if you guys can go off of that. I, just, I was just going to let you know what I'm working on. Uh, I have, uh, I'm working on states right now for the Iron Jury Chronicles, book eight. <laughs> and, uh, so it's probably going to be time to know that I'm almost done. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I think I got a couple of weeks left. I really, I really wanted to get it finished uh, before uh, June fifteenth. That's what I'm trying to do. And um, so, if I get that sucker done, Del Rey is already on an, an accelerated uh, production schedule because usually it takes a year from the time you turn in a book to, to the time it gets on the shelf. Uh, Ten to twelve months is kind of your average. So they are going to try to get that sucker out like six and seven months. So you could possibly have it by the end of this year. Possibly. But it might more uh, more likely be like really early January or something like that. We, we don't have the actual date nailed down, but it's coming soon. We are going to figure that out. In fact, I was talking with, with uh, David and Keith uh, from Del Rey about it. We got we to gotta hammer this out and let, let people know what it's going to be. And uh, I've already seen early drafts of the cover. I think it might be my favorite. Uh, and uh, I, I've, I've been traveling Europe doing a lot of research on it, um, and all the places that I went in Europe are going to show up in the book, uh, because I, I really do enjoy uh, including real settings in there to anchor the fantasy, so that's why you have so much of Tempe in that, you know, you can go to Rulabula and really get those awesome fish and chips and so on. Uh, so all of the places that you're going to see, you know, in Book 8 are, you know, of course, real places as well. I had the most awesome time in Poland hunting down where the Polish coven now lives and figuring out what they've been doing. And uh, the Polish uh, readers are so very welcoming. And it's funny because I, in Warsaw, they, they have their uh, town divided up into districts. And what, out here, we might just say neighborhoods or whatever, but they have districts, and there's one district uh, called Radosh that translates into joy. <laughs> it's just that way, too, not just joy, it's joy. <laughs> right? So uh, you, you go into the Radosh uh, neighborhood, and it's really interesting. It's kind of. Uh, wooded, it's heavily wooded, and they have larger parcels of land there and so on for the houses. And the reason it's been left that way is because the soil on that side of the Viswa River is very sandy, and the only thing that will really grow there are pine trees with the really deep roots so they can hang on and not fall over. So uh, you have this lovely little pine forest area, and and Therefore, the properties all have sort of gates around them and lots of vegetation, etc. And it's perfect, you know, private spaces for witches to do rituals. <laughs> so, <laughs> bury bodies, <laughs> whatever they might need. So, I've been having, you know, I took photographs of the actual house and he figured out where it was. Just like, I mean, the widow of McDonough's house, I know exactly where that is. I know where Atticus's house is. These are real places that, uh, 
you know? One time I drove up to the, I was showing somebody where Atticus's house is, and, uh, and the people who live there came out, can I help you? Because, you know, they're a little worried about complete strangers just hovering outside their, their home. And, uh, and, and so the people I was with us, you guys are in a book. <laughs> what? <laughs> and so, so yeah, we, we wound up uh, you know telling them, explaining what was going on, and they're like, well, I guess I better get that book about my house then. <laughs> and, and, and it was a good time. Uh, so they're, they're very sweet people, and they're photographers, and, and so on. And uh, anyway, where was I going with this? <laughs> um, oh, what well, was I working on? I, I, so I will be done with it soon, and then after that, I'm going to be uh, completing um, the first volume of my epic fantasy trilogy that uh, Del Rey has already bought, and uh, it's going to be called the Seven Kennings Trilogy, and the first volume of that will be called The Plague of Giants. Rawr! And, uh, well, the Rawr is not part of the title. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, but mentally, in my head, I always go, Rawr! When I think of giants. So, uh, That'll be coming out. It, I, I was actually writing on that, uh, writing it right after I finished Star Wars, and I, I got 130,000 words into it, and I was expecting it to be around 200,000 words long. So you know, I'm I'm over halfway finished with it, but you know, my the, my editor called me up one day. And said, Would you mind uh, maybe writing the next Iron Druid book and then coming back to that? You know, <laughs> Okay. So uh, that's that's why uh, you know there was this delay there. I was actually writing an epic fantasy on top of Star Wars before I got into writing this one. However, if I finish uh, State, if I finish it by June fifteenth, it will be the fastest I've ever written uh, a novel because uh, five months was my record, and this would be four and a half because I started it on February first. So, uh, Ehaw, right? Uh, I also have one, a couple of other things that, like, these are uh, short fiction things that you might not have heard about because uh, I kind of just self-published them real quick. Um, two of them are, uh, the, it's, one's called Two Tales of the Iron Druid Chronicles, and they were uh, short stories that were given away for free with the ebook version of Hounded and Hammered, but unless you bought those, you would never see those stories. Uh, and, and actually, some people who bought them didn't realize they were there. And, and you know they were part of the contents, and they never looked at the contents to see that there was bonus material. So they've had them all the time, just didn't know. So anyway, I just put them out there. I got I commissioned some new art for it uh, from Galen Dara, who's uh, who lives in Tucson. She's fabulous, and um, and I've got that out for ninety nine cents. And then if you're an audio listener, Luke Daniels did the audio for it. Yes. And it's like seven bucks. I think you know super cheap because it's an hour and a half long in audio. So, so if you want those, that those are available, um, you know, wherever you get your ebooks or audio. And then, if, um, three slices is a, an, a miniature anthology about tyromancy. And have you guys ever heard of tyromancy? I hadn't either, and so as soon as I did, I had to write about it because it's it's the how you tell the future with cheese. There's, <laughs> like there's a word for that. <laughs> All right, so then I look into it. It's like, like this is a real thing. Like people have been doing it. There's a fine tradition of tyromancy out there, and, and and it's like the part, not just like you go to the deli, you know, and have them slice you a pound and go, okay, danger ahead. You know, it's not like that. It, it's it's really uh, what you do is you, it, in the process of coagulation, the, the you know uh, where you're curdling the the cream or the milk. Um, there's patterns happening there, and of course it's sort of fractal in its complexity, and therefore uh, it, it can maybe show you the future if you can interpret it correctly. So tyromancers, that's kind of what they did, is they made cheese, and in the process of it, they could tell the future. So um, I said, you know what, I, I don't want it to just be me, I want the world's first tyromancy anthology. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I know that's crazy enough to do this with me? So, Chuck Windig, uh, who is writing the next Star Wars book, Aftermath, he has his Miriam Black novella in there called Interlude Swallow. So if you've never read Chuck before, this is a great chance. And then Delilah S. Dawson uh, also wrote a novella from her Blood World in there. 
and all of them have tyromancy in the, the little novellas. So it's about three quarters of a novel in terms of length, because we have three novellas in there, and uh, we have that available in uh, ebook and audio as well. Plus there are illustrations and signs from Gail and Dara. So if you're getting the ebook part. So my, my novella is called Trailing to War, picks up right after Shattered, gets you ready for Staked, and um, I, I have a lot of fun writing it. When I do short fiction, I tend to let Oberon off the chain a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, right? So they, they tend to be a little bit, there's more Oberon in the short fiction than there is in the novels. Because when I write the novels, my editor says, that's a little bit much. And, uh, and so, uh, when I do my own stuff, it, it, you know, I have a little bit more fun with him. And so I hope you guys will enjoy it. If you haven't picked those up, there's three slices and two tails of the Iron Drew Chronicles are out there. Let me see. I think that's it. I think I covered everything. So that I wanted to say. Um, but what I really would like to do is make sure I answer your questions. And uh, so if you have any, please feel free to ask. You can just stand up or you can sit down or yeah, whatever you want to do, shout, go for it. Okay. Um, so first off, uh, I'm not going to go to the mic just because. That's fine, that's fine. I can hear you. I can be loud. Uh, first off, I have my buddy Mario. Uh, Sweet. Who's on another panel doing mythical weapons. And he's. Uh -huh paying tribute to Molotov and Fregara in oh, there as well. Um, but my question is, what was the inspiration for the Iron Druid Chronicles? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you uh, for that awesome question. What was the inspiration for it? Um, at the time uh, I, I started writing Hounded, I had just sent off an epic fantasy uh, to a publisher. So I didn't have an agent. I just finished it and I sent it off. And I got a response back in two weeks, which was way faster than I thought, you know. And they said, we kind of liked it, so we're going to pass it on up the chain to the next editor to improve it and see, you know, we'll see how it goes. So it was this very encouraging, you know, first step of, you know, maybe selling a book. And I couldn't believe it. I was just doing, you know, dancing in the kitchen and all that good stuff. And I was just, you know, since I had this positive feedback, I was filled with this creative energy, you know? So I knew I would have to wait a while, but man, I want to write something else now. Let's, let's do this, <laughs> all right? So what am I gonna write? Well, let's, let's just have fun. I'm just having fun here because I'm expecting the other one to sell. You know, I'm hopeful, right? So to entertain myself, I thought, well, I like donkeys. <laughs> uh, and and uh, what if we had a magic user who could talk to dogs, but I didn't want to have a wizard or a witch because Traditionally, the relationship that, that uh, witches and wizards have with animals is sort of a, a master-servant kind of thing, like they're familiars, and, you must do my bidding, you know? And, and so the, the animal is now kind of a slave instead of a friend. Didn't want that. So I wanted a magic user that would be more of a friend to the animal, and uh, I came up with, well, druids seem kind of friendly. <laughs> and, and, and so, so uh, I, and then I also realized that nobody was writing about druids, and so that seemed like an opportunity, possibly, to tell a story that hasn't been told before. I started looking into uh, mythology and uh, about druids, realized that the druids never wrote a single thing down, which meant that I could make up whatever I wanted, <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody could say I was wrong. <laughs> So I'm like, this is this is getting good. <laughs> so, so now, um, I, but what I did do is make sure that whatever powers I gave the druids were attested to by multiple sources. So keeping in mind that all of the people who did write about the druids hated them, right? Uh, you you have to take some of it and just chuck it away, you know. So um, you know there were Christians writing about them. Greeks and, and, and Caesar, you know, who was out to basically destroy them, you know, all of them wrote about the Druids. But the 12 year training period, I got that from Caesar. That's what he wrote down, that the, the Druids were training for that long before they became actual Druids. Um, and then, I, you know, I had no reason to believe that Caesar would, would be making that number up. He found, you know, that this was the, the, the time that they trained. Um, and then there were multiple sources that said that Druids could shapeshift in animals and, and that they have some control over the weather and so on. So what I, what I did come up with was this magical system binding, that's my whole thing, and getting tattooed and all that, bound to the earth, that's all my stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, I tried to, you know, just kind of unify all of the different, you know, myths surrounding Druids 
in, into one cohesive kind of magic system. Um, so, and then I'm looking in through the stories of Irish mythology going, wow, these, these gods are fascinating. Why isn't anybody writing about them besides the Morgan? And you know, the Morgan's great. She's spooky and, you know, sexy and awesome, you know? But there are all these other Irish gods that are a lot of fun. Flittish never gets written about. She's the huntress that is not the virgin. She's the opposite. She really enjoys sex and there's no shame in it or anything like that. Let's, let's have some more of that. <laughs> so, so, uh, so let's put in Flittish and let's put in Briad, who's this wonderful, uh, you know, goddess of poetry and fire and forge, and, 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 and let's just have some more fun with the Irish gods that nobody's really talking about. And plus, Angus Bo, you look into his stories about what he did, he was a, supposed to be the god of love, but he was a huge dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he would make sure that people, you know, instead of, you know, they would die for love, you know, uh, and, and uh, not really enjoy, have, have a fulfilling time, you know. And, and it says a lot about, you know, the Irish view of love is that love hurts, instead of, you know, love is this wonderful thing. And I guess Ode oh, would pretty much make sure you, you, you know, hated being in love almost, you know. Um, so I found all that stuff really fascinating. The more I got into it, the more, you know, fodder I had for, you know, ideas. But then I thought, well, if I'm gonna have a druid, why in the heck is he still alive today? Um, and then I found that there are three different ways that you can have immortality in Irish mythology. It was already there. I was like, cool. <laughs> I don't have to make up a reason for him to be alive because they have the hogs of Munna McClear, which you, if you eat them, they automatically sort of regenerate a little later on. So you have infinite hogs, you know, but they also confer youth. So it's like the bacon of youth. How rad is that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I eat bacon and I live longer? Perfect. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Gufnu uh, is the, the god of brewing, and he supposedly also had a, a, uh, a, a one of his many, many beers was uh, an ale that would also confer vitality and youth to you. You just had to kind of drink it semi-regularly, so it's like, okay, you guys are great. Have more bacon than beer, and you'll live longer. So just fabulous, you the Irish are great. So, so then, um, there's uh, also the, the uh, mythology surrounding Ermit, and I told that mythology in uh, Two Ravens and One Crow, where she, uh, she had this brother, Mia, who was slain, and out of his grave, grew 365 herbs that then she categorized and uh, was learning all the properties about them and so on. And she was spreading this out in her cave. And then the father, Dian Kecht, was so um, uh, jealous and so on that, that his son had surpassed him in healing. And now here was his daughter doing the same thing, that he was just, you know, a dick and, you know, scattered everything to the wind. But, she was a druid, she would have remembered a whole heck of a lot, but you know, and then she shared that with Atticus, and including the recipe for immortality. <laughs> and this is, uh, yeah, it's Atticus and, you know, yeah, just me, I like stupid puns. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite pun for Shattered, honestly, is a Spanish one, and I don't know how many folks caught it, but uh, without spoiling too much, you know, there's a certain guy, well, Jesus, he comes back in Shattered, and he pulls tequila out of his pocket, and it's called Milagro Tequila. You guys know what Milagro is? It's a miracle. miracle, yeah. It's a miracle tequila. I saw that. I'm like, how funny are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I write this thing, and I'm like, oh, that's great. And I, and I never know if anybody else is going to get it. So, uh, that's that's uh, me being silly. So, um, so that, that's kind of where it, it all started. It, well, it, it just grew with this. I started with, with Oberon, is who I started with. I like dogs. And then I kind of built from there with my own interest in doing more and more research. And then I discovered that, you know, now that I know that I want a druid and I want him to be a really old druid, and there is a reason for him to be that old or to make it to that age, but why would he be in hiding? Why would you have this druid who is in hiding for all this time? So then I had to come up with a reason for that. And then I found it again in the mythology. Because Fragorat is this real sword that the two of the Danish gave to Khan of the Hundred Battles. And then there's never any record in the mythology of Khan returning it. 
So I'm like, I know why. My druid stole it. <laughs> That's why he is hiding and not really, you know, making a difference in the world for all this time because the gods, the Irish gods, want their sword back and he doesn't want to give it back. So that, you know, I, I built everything out of existing mythology or holes in that mythology and uh, went from there. So, and then once, once I thought, hey, if I'm making the Irish pantheon real, you know, they exist, why, why wouldn't the others exist? And the answer was, they do. <laughs> they all exist. And then it became super fun, you know, to, to play with all of the world's uh, myths and religions, but really not all of them, just the ones that Atticus runs into because he's my first person narrator, right? So that's how the structure kind of got born there. It took some research and fun and uh, finding my way it took uh, 11 months to write Hounded, and then, uh, and, and this was, uh, remember, this was all just me geeking out, you know, and, and entertaining myself while I'm waiting to hear back on the epic fantasy. So, uh, <laughs> I get done with it, and I'm like, well, okay, that was fun, now, now what do I do? And my wife's like, well, you're going to send it out, <laughs> but, uh, but you're, you're going to get an agent. Um, and I was, you know, instead of sending it to a publisher, I was going to get an agent, she said, you know, because Honestly, I hadn't heard back from that publisher, right, in 11 months. It was a, and I sent them a, a, a card in the meantime, hey, are you guys still thinking about that epic you told me about? Yeah, we're still thinking. I'm like, that's a lot of thinking, that's a long time. And so um, I got an agent in about a month. Um, I, I, I sent, uh, hounded out to several agents and 23 agents said, no, it's not for everybody, and that's fine. But my one agent, uh, you know, who said, yes, I'll represent this, he sent it out to nine publishers, and in two weeks, versus 11 months of no answer, right? In two weeks, Hounded had offers from four different publishers, and I got to choose, you know, choose which one I went with. So obviously I went with uh, Del Rey, and uh, gosh, I thought, you know, having an agent is a lot faster. <laughs> And, 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 you know, yay to my wife for making me send it out, because honestly, I thought, this is crap, nobody's going to want to read this. And though she was like, no, no, you were going to send it out. <laughs> so, uh, she is right, always. <laughs> and, uh, so yay, yay wife, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, so, so after that, uh, we, we went, one of the four companies, or the four publishers that asked about how did, they were like, uh, well, one of them was the one that had been sitting on my epic for a year. That was really ironic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, I told my agent at that point, I'm like, really, this publisher offered on Hounded? Well, they've had my epic for a year. He's like, you wrote an epic? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And so he asked them about it, you know, and they looked at it like, no, we don't want it. <laughs> but uh, we'd really like to, to do Hounded. So uh, I went with Del Rey instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, you know, now the, the epic that I'm writing now, the, the Seven Kennings, is a vastly reworked version of that earlier one that kind of got some, you know, interest, but not enough. And, and, and they were right, honestly, to reject it. It was not ready, it was not, not good enough. And, I, you know, I, I can see that super clearly now. And um, hopefully the, uh, the Seven Kennings is, is a, you know, quite a few steps above that. I've learned some stuff since then, so super long-winded answer to yours. <laughs> but I hope hopefully that that uh, filled you in there. Yeah. Uh, do me back. I like your hat. Thanks. Um, I was also around your age when I first saw Star Wars, and right from the beginning there was this huge uh, uh, side world. Uh, did you, you know, from Marvel Comics to to <coughs> Star Wars, yeah. uh, Star Wars epic side stories, uh, prequels, things like that. And so, I have sort of a two-part question. The first one is, how, how, what was it like being stepping into something? How, how, uh, uh, how controlled were you, were, the, were the, the Lucas people in saying, here's what you can do with this, and here's what you can't do? What was it like working that experience? And then the second part. Which is sort of tangentially related. How do you feel about J.J. Abrams saying, "Yeah, that whole thing that everybody's been creating for three years, we're going to throw that out and we're going to do a different, a different line on that"? 
Mm, okay, well, I guess I'll answer the second part first. Um, <laughs> I'm cool with it. I just like stories. And, and, and the stories that are, you know, not, not canon and are now legends, well, they're still cool stories. And so I don't have a problem with any of it. And I, and I actually do kind of like the idea that now everything is coordinated from now on. That going forward anyway, it, it's... I think, you know, earlier in the 70s and 80s and stuff, they're just like, gosh, there's a lot of money to be made out there. Let's, let's hurry, let's pump some out. And, and let's get these stories out there. And they didn't have a lot of coordination. So, of course, there was a lot of, you know, you go to Wikipedia and they're like, well, this is contradicted by that because, oh my God, over here, this. You know, and they, they've analyzed things to such a great extent and it's, it's amazing and, and thorough and awesome. But you do see that the lack of coordination kind of led to some, you know, dodgy bits. So I think that now that they're coordinating everything, that's pretty neat of them. So, uh, yeah, I'm not terribly upset. I'm looking forward to the new movie, and, you know, uh, we'll see how it goes, right? Because, uh, you know, if he, if he screws it up, you know what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, the, the first part, um, it, it's, the control really wasn't the issue, the, 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 the control was already there because I'm writing a book in between two movies that we can't change now, you know? Um, so any characters I introduce, we've got to have a reason why they're not in The Empire Strikes Back. You know? So um, that, that structure was kind of already there. Um, I, the things that I needed help on were, uh, well, the things that they argued about were, were really had no bearing on me was, is Admiral Akbar a captain or an admiral or a commander? Or I'm like, I don't care, he's this fish guy. He's got a moist charisma. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that, that was stuff that I didn't have to worry about. You know, and they told me, you know, you don't have to worry about minutiae like that. You know, what's this ship and how many horsepower? <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about the engines and things like that. We will tell you if you screw it up and we'll fix it. Um, you know, those little details. And I'm grateful for that because honestly, I don't know the science part, you know. Well, a lot of the Star Wars science doesn't make sense anyway. <laughs> so, and we're all cool with that, right? It's a fantasy, it's a cool story, you know. Somehow they figured it out. And so, um, that stuff was really their bag of chips. And then, you know, I mean, the story was, was mine, so, you know, if you dig it, you know, you, you are welcome to say, yay, Kevin. And if you hate it, you can also blame me. You know, it's, it's not Lucas's fault, and it's, you know, it, 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 it's all me. So, <laughs> that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks, man. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. In Shattered, you uh, reintroduce that character to Agnes, who was from his past. I don't want to spoil it because you haven't read it. No so. spoilers. But, um, <laughs> Did, were you always planning on doing that? And yeah. Well, it, it came up in book four. Book four, okay. If you look at book four, I, that's where I put in the hint that okay. he would show up someday. Mm -hmm. If you, there's that dream sequence that he has. Yeah, I just wasn't sure. And if that's, you planned that from the beginning or from book four, you're like, I have a clean um, idea. You know what was cool? Is in book seven, I had this thing where uh, a character from book three that a very minor character in book three uh, got introduced with a certain belief structure, and then that became the reason in book seven that everything kind of happened the way it did, and Atticus realized it. So that was the point where I went, oh my god, that is such a great idea that, you know, it looks like I planned it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but I just realized that, that it was there. So, I mean, honestly, what you do when you're writing a series, I mean, this is a great you know, question or example of what, what you do when you write a series. You put in a lot of characters and a lot of different ideas in the hopes that someday those will be useful. <laughs> okay? And so you're seeding things, if that makes sense. You're planting seeds. And then in later books, you know, you can start using those and then you look exceedingly clever when, <laughs> in fact, you were just like throwing some random shit out there. <laughs> you know, glorious crops later. <laughs> so um, that's, that's kind of what happened. But I did plan all along, with that particular character you're talking about, I did plan for him to show up at some point. And um, I wanted to um, put that in, uh, you know, the hint that he would be coming in book four. So, and he's a lot of fun to write. My God, he's fun. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, my editor is, just, is her favorite thing now. You know, she's like, I sent her like a couple of chapters from his point of view for the new book, and uh, and, 
and I seriously, I'm, I'm giggling my head off when I'm writing this chapter. It's just so much fun. So, because his language is, is so different, and, and he's just rude, and he doesn't care. So, it's a good time. Yes, sir. Would you consider doing any prequels of Boeing in here? Possibly. I'm actually thinking of doing stuff down the road with him. Like, after these nine books are done, um, what will, you know, I love the fact that he was pulled forward and thrust into our modern society without really being prepared for it. And I love him being from another time, running into our assorted silliness and commenting on it. I think that's a lot of fun. So I'm thinking about doing stuff with him, you know, after the nine books, maybe a spinoff, just him as the protagonist instead, especially since he's so much fun for me to write. Don't think yeah. about it. <laughs> well, let's see, again, I, I mean, it, it's too early for me. I, I, I'm just thinking about it because I still have to finish the Harry Truman Chronicles, and then I also have to finish the Epic Trilogy before I can really start doing, you know, other stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I am thinking about that. I'm also thinking about doing things with the Polish Company because I think they're fascinating as well. Because one of the things that I've always been disappointed about, with, about witches is that they're either incredibly evil or incredibly good. And I wanted witches that were, you know, human. You know, human, human is perfect. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, because, you know, when we are given power, and this is one of the reasons I really enjoy Grindelwald too. She's us. What if we were given those powers? What would we do with that power? Yeah. Uh, would we, you know, go to the dark side, or would we? Uh, use them for good, or would we kind of mess up sometimes and do some stupid stuff and then try to make it better later? And, uh, you know, this is what Atticus is dealing with. He's trying to deal with stupid crap he's done and try to make it better. And sometimes he gets himself in worse trouble, you know, which is, of course, what we do, too. Oh, I'm sorry I ran over your dog. Let me give you another one. <laughs> and then it's the wrong kind of dog or whatever. You know, I mean, you just make things worse somehow when you're trying to do, you know, do the right thing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun exploring those issues. Yes? Uh, do you have any advice for future writers? Well, well definitely. I, I started out at 19 writing, and then I didn't get published until I was 39. <laughs> so yeah, I was about or 38. So yeah, that was, that was 19 years of failing really hard. But what I was doing at the same time was, was trying really hard. So um, I wrote for a very long time with the day job, you know, and um, I didn't quit the day job until after Tripped came out. So um, getting your first book contract usually does not mean you, you get to quit right away. You have to have a few books under your belt and then you're getting consistent royalties on those before you have an income that can support you and you don't have to wear pants anymore. <laughs> So the the uh, just you just really have to keep writing your stories and, and and tell those stories and you will get better as you go along. The biggest thing I learned from my first book, which was terrible, but the biggest thing I learned was that uh, hey, I can complete a novel because it took me a long time to figure out how to actually finish a full book. And, and I learned so much in the process of writing that first book. You know, mostly things to not do again. But also, that there's just this huge gush of confidence that you get once you finish your first book. Because you know that once you've done it, you can do it again. And you can do it faster. Because all of those same mistakes are not going to happen again. So I, my second book, my first book took me six years. My second book took me three. How did it took me 11 months? Okay, and then Hex took me five months. So, you, you know, the confidence you get and, you know, the practice just makes you much more faster, you know, much faster and efficient along with, I, I still, you know, haven't broken the five month barrier. Hex and Shattered were five months and I'm trying to break it with State and do four and a half months. But the other thing that I got better at was edits. I had a ton of notes on how to make that better because that was my very first book. I had to go through five different drafts of how it before they accepted it and said, okay, it's ready to publish. But I've gotten fewer notes with each successive book. I'm starting to learn how not to screw up. And, uh, you know, it, it makes the whole process more efficient. Yeah. 
Have you been working with the same editor or yeah. editing team that's been consistently? Well, well, Star Wars was a different editing team, but yes, the, the, there's a the Del Rey is a Star Wars editor, and then there's the Lucas editors, and so there were the the team of people. So that's a much longer process, just because you have so many more people commenting on your manuscripts and taking a look at it. But um, I've had Trisha Narwani as my editor at Del Rey from the beginning. She's the one who you know acquired me, if that's the right word. And uh, you know I've been working with her ever since. I'm, and I, I, uh, I love working with her. She, we, we trust each other um, with our comments and stuff like that. So um, she always makes the book better. Always. Yes? Uh, I was just curious if we might ever see some sort of anthology of all of the Ironwood shorter fictions in a physical print. Um, maybe, but I'm not, just don't hold your breath on it. The <laughs> reason for that is because the rights are held by different folks. So like, for example, The Chapel Perilous, was given to um, the Unfettered Anthology, and then they sold the whole anthology overseas to the UK. Then they also sold audio rights, and then what they did was they returned ebook rights to me. So that's why you can buy The Chapel Perilous for 99 cents as an ebook, but I can't put it in anything else because the rights for that for print are taken up in the United States and the UK, and you know, by other companies, and I can't print it anywhere else. I can just do the ebook version only. See, so then the similar thing is happening with um, Carney Punk's uh, the Demon Barker Wheat Street, which was pretty fun. That was my story with the highest body count in it, and uh, so that was in the Carney Punk anthology. And so those rights are owned by Simon and Schuster, completely different from Delray. So it was sold to a different company. So I, they're selling it separately themselves as 99 cents, or you can buy it in the anthology. But I can't put the Demon Barker into a different anthology, you see what I mean? So it, it's, it's all rights issues. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, you, you probably won't. What I just try to do is try to make them as cheap as possible in ebook. So, yeah. Um, can we find, it's like, do you have a website where we can find the links to those audio books? Kevin <laughs> Yeah. Find the links to the audio uh, Indeed. Books? Yeah, if you go, uh, like for the, the novellas, are you talking about short fiction or are you talking about uh, the novels? Uh, the novellas. Yeah, the novellas, uh, there's a, uh, on the side of my website, you'll see, well, first of all, you'll see Overrun. <laughs> and then, on the left-hand side, you will see one that says stories. And if you hover your mouse over that, it'll say novels, novellas, and short stories. So click on the one you want, it'll take you there, and then I have links for each one. Or, of course, you know, you could just look at the titles and then go to your favorite place and look it up by title and find it that way, too. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I grew up with a lot of these Irish myths of bedtime stories because my family's really Irish on both sides. Cool. So how long, so how did you do your research for the myths? Because yeah. I obviously grew up with it, but it doesn't seem like you did. I, yeah, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I have the Irish heritage and stuff, but not turbo Irish, if that makes sense. More <laughs> Irish American, right? Um, so what I did was I started with Wikipedia because uh, what Wikipedia is really good about doing is giving you links at the bottom now. That's how they've gotten all their, you know, what legitimacy they have, is that uh, you, you have to have a bibliography of the original source material. So you go down and read that. And what that did is it, it, when I started, like, I looked up Tua Dedanit, okay? So at the bottom of the Tua Dedanit stuff, you just start clicking links and figuring out, well, where did they get the source for this little summary they wrote up about Flittish? Okay. And those links are like to Irish university websites, where what they've done is like, the, it's Trinity College in Dublin. They've uh, taken the old Irish uh, manuscripts, and they have translated them into English. So I read the, you know, translations from the Irish university websites um, to to get my source material because a lot of the, a lot of that stuff is not actually collected in an English bound form, but the manuscripts do exist and they're online and they're free. You just gotta wade through it and go go do that do it. So um, that's what I did. Is I got my stuff from the Irish universities. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, so you've done a lot of anthologies and compilations and stuff like that with other authors who have very similar writing styles. Uh, is there any plan or any possibility you might ever like do a crossover with one of those authors? Not so much crossovers. The problem with crossovers is that uh, 
Uh, oh, maybe. There's one I've talked about with Jay Wells. She has this little demon cat called Gagool, and uh, I thought a better adventure with Gagool, this little ball, one of those little ball, like uh, Dr. Evil cats. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I don't know what they're called. What are they called? Sphinxes. Okay, yeah, cool. Sphinx cats. <laughs> you know, and, and you're like, man, man, grow a whisker, you know? Uh, so those ball uh, Sphinx cats, that's what Gagool is. And I thought that uh, te that, you know, sort of demon cat teaming up with Oberon would be pretty damn fun. <laughs> <laughs> and doing the story between the two of them. And uh, Gagool's, um, you know, owner, whatever, I don't know, I don't want to say owner, but human, is actually half the vampire, Selena Kane. And uh, so I thought, well, this could be an interesting story. Uh, somehow, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And, you know, we only we, crossovers are just tough because we already have um, our our own schedules to do. You know, our own deadlines to meet, and that would be definitely a, a side item. Plus, if the author that we're talking about crossing over with is with a different publisher, that makes it more difficult to happen too. Then you have agents who want their thing. You know, it, it just it's tough to do them. So. Um, I have enough ideas on my own, and, and plus, you know, writers are sort of by nature solitary people, and they don't want to necessarily team up with others, they want to do their own thing, so it's just, it, that's why it doesn't happen very often, and why I'm, I'm not really planning it, you know, so, uh, yes? Do you miss teaching I miss the kids. I, I don't miss theirs on the legislature's laws about education, <laughs> I do not miss a single faculty meeting ever, uh, I don't miss the shitty coffee. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I do miss the kids, and I do miss talking about literature. I love teaching the wasteland to them. I love teaching the Great Gatsby, etc. Uh, but I, but a lot of the, the stuff that was not teaching, you know, in other words, uh, that's the part I just really do not miss. Uh, I seriously can't think of a, a, a single faculty meeting in my 17 years of teaching that was a, a, an actual good use of my time. <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, I, my, my wife uh, uh, was teaching for 19 years too. We met in college uh, as English education majors. And fell in love over John Keats. <laughs> and a 20 year anniversary now in August. but I tried to write Hounded as this very grim thing. <laughs> I'm just gonna write a book that kicks ass. <laughs> Let's turn on the heavy bill, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's really what I was trying to do, and then, the, and then you see what came out. So um, yes, I tried to write my epic fantasy as very grim, but it will not be that way. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I just sort of, I, I'm too much of a smartass to, uh, to let something slide. Um, and, and, the, and the humor is, is it's different because there's very different characters. Obviously it's a completely different magic system, completely different world. But um, there, there will be some moments of humor because I think that it is a vital part of our lives. It's something that normally happens. When things are completely grim and doom all the time, I actually find that a little bit unrealistic. People, you know, sometimes they just rip a fart and it's funny. <laughs> you, you know, so so let's let's you know, I, there of course, you know, I hope hopefully in somewhere in my books you have been kind of you know freaked out or scared or something at some point. So you know, I think there is that balance. For me, what's scary? I think the horror is scary. A lot of people tell me they love her. I'm like, what? <laughs> she's oh my god, no. And, 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 and she's scared. Writing her scares me, and so does the the skinwalkers on the horror. Oh, yeah. 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 And actually, I heard that a lot of uh, you know, well, not a lot, but you know, the the few people from the Navajo Nation who, who read it were like. What the hell? How did he get that right? You know, uh, is that that seriously is their nightmare? Then and, and they, they they fear those uh, skinwalkers, uh, you know, quite sincerely. Those are not just you know kids' tales that you grow up out of. They they still fear people that are that evil. You know, so um, yes. Uh, 
where did the division of the four shifting animal types come from, and what would your four be? Oh, dude, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, well, I just figured that the, 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 my rationale, I don't know what my animals will be, honestly, because, and this is kind of my cop-out, because uh, I figured that the Earth would choose it. it the idea was that, uh, do you guys know that the Sahara Desert used to be sort of a sort of lush desert like, like this one? Um, and, and then something happened 5,000 years ago and it just became sand. And so, again, I, I take historical things like that or archaeological stuff and then come up with a, a reason for it. And I, you know, the idea was that the elemental was destroyed there. Uh, and that, that uh, you get some of that history in Grimoire of the Lamp. Uh, that's my Egyptian one. So, um, so the idea being is that the, the two of Dan were chosen to be the first druids and and protect the earth, and that Gaia wanted, that in order for them to be able to protect the earth, they needed to go places maybe, sometimes maybe humans couldn't go. So they needed to fly, they needed to have a sea form, you know, a swimming you know, creature of some sort. They needed to be able to be really fast on land, so they would have a hoofed animal. And then they might sometimes need some sharp pointy things. So yeah, you have your predator, your land-based predator. So all of that was, that was just a, a logical thing of what Gaia might need, uh, you know, in a protector, um, so that tragedies like the Sahara Desert don't happen again. That was kind of my rationale for that whole thing. So uh, sometimes people ask me what the Morian's forms are, and I'm like, well, there's the crow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, I, I would figure, you know, that people would obviously favor one form over another. So, Owen really likes the bear, Atticus, you know, tends to like the, well, he, he goes between a lot of them, but he, he likes the hound and he likes the owl, you know, and uh, Ron Newell really likes um, the horse, you know. So it just depends uh, on, on the person, and I, I never really came up with what the Morgans, it didn't, it, I knew that I would never use it for the story, so I never even thought about it. She's the battle crow, whatever her other forms are, yeah. Whatever you think. Have fun. <laughs> Role play a little bit. You know? <laughs> you know, I don't own that part. You know, you, you know, do, do what you want with the Morgan or whoever. So, yes, sir. So, all the goals that you have on the stories are have physical manifestation, right? The, all of them have. Will we ever see Gaia's physical manifestation, or is that something that we will never see? Oh, yeah. The way I, yeah, the way I mean, because someone believes in her, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, the way that I've envisioned it is that she's too, I mean, the Earth is her physical manifestation and all the creatures on it are her physical manifestation, if that makes any sense. She's part of all of us, and she, but subsumed within, and it's difficult to talk to her directly, and her uh, elementals are like her avatars. Um, so, um, down the road I have Atticus, you know, on the last book, you know, I've, I've already got the plan. Uh, you know, Atticus will, will be communicating with her directly. Uh, but it, it's it's uh, you know a longer process to be able to do that so uh, than, than talk to an elemental. So okay. great question. Any others? Yes. Sir. Why was the Chapel Perilous named thus? It seemed like it was a really small part of. It was like a yeah. staging. Yeah. Part. Of the, yeah. Okay. The, the question was why was the Chapel Perilous named that uh, since it was kind of a small part of the actual story and so on. That was me being a total English geek. Okay? <laughs> the the thing was, um, the prompt was write whatever you want, <laughs> because it was for the unfettered anthology, and everything was supposed to help out this this cancer patient, the the publisher, pay his medical bills. Yeah, he beat it. He beat cancer he twice. Not so, so, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of a, a win-win situation for everybody. You know, we really like Sean Speakman, and uh, we wanted to help him out. And um, he says, you know, I want to be free of my medical debt. You know, he was a guy who had, he beat cancer, but then he had like $150,000 of medical debt. And this was before, you know, the American Affordable Care Act came into being. So um, we decided we we're going to help him out by donating a story and then once he had enough money from that, those proceeds to pay off his medical bills, he would return the rights to us, and that's how I got the rights back to Chapel Perilous. Now, since we could write about whatever we wanted, I was like, I'm a huge T.S. Eliot, Grail legend geek, and so the Chapel Perilous was my 
chance to take my own story mythology and wed it to the Holy Grail stuff. And part of the Holy Grail legends, almost all of them include the Grail Knight visiting the Chapel Perilous right before he crosses the wasteland and meets the Fisher King. And at the Chapel Perilous, spooky shit happens. <laughs> okay, so, and I always thought, you know, you know, it's always the Chapel Perilous, it's never, never the Perilous Chapel. So I just liked the fun pretentiousness of putting the, the adjective at the end. Um, but in the Chapel Perilous, it's always surrounded by a perilous graveyard. And in, around that graveyard, sometimes <coughs> stuff comes to life. But most of the time, the creepy stuff happened inside the chapel. There was sometimes a knight laid out on the altar. Sometimes he was covered with a sheet. Sometimes not. Sometimes he had a weapon. Sometimes not. Um, and then there were lights, you know, and the, all, the mysterious thing about the candles was like, who lit the freaking candles if the night is dead? And uh, that part, you know, the, you know, the, the grail night when he was going in there, it's like, hmm, where did this light come from? Who lit these candles? And uh, it must have been recent because candles don't stay alight forever. So, um, and, and the spookiest one that always freaked me out the most was just one candle in this chapel and the grail knight is approaching the altar and there's this one candle above it and then this disembodied black hand not as in i mean like carbon or burned black kind of black hands not uh, anybody um, you know, of color it, it, it was just like this nasty demon hand or the hand of satan was really the idea okay comes up and snuffs out the candle right as he gets now you're in the dark you know chapel with a demon hand that doesn't give a damn that you are in a chapel <laughs> you know and, and so the the knight has to really you know fight evil before he can go to the fisher king and get the holy grail so i just thought that was always the creepiest image of this hand coming up go it's dark <laughs> so uh I, I wanted to write about that, and, and that's why uh, and I'll come up with a reason why that would all work. And, um, so that's it all uh, came from Grail Legends. There's a ton of Grail Legend geekery hidden, even little Easter eggs, hidden inside of that story that I, I don't think anybody will ever get, you know, unless they're Grail scholars themselves. So, sorry, that was me just, you know, being a geek. Yeah. Yes? For uh, tricked. Did you spend time on the Navajo Nation doing research there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had a student uh, from the Navajo Nation in my classes, and I got to talk to her about it. But the fun thing was, you can only, they can only talk about coyote. Yeah. Dizzy. I'm here. Hi, Dizzy. <laughs> this is Dizzy. She, she helped me out. Um, Dizzy helped me out uh, by, by talking about coyote with me, but only during a certain part of the year. It was pretty fun because I'd ask, Dizzy, can I ask you something about coyote? No, 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 bye. <laughs> and then she came to me like three months later, Mr. Herman, would you like to have that conversation now? And, and uh, which one was that? Are you talking about a grade? No, 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 about coyote. And I was like, oh yeah, what was going on there? Why didn't you want to talk about it? She said, well, we can't. Certain times of the year, it's going to draw coyote's attention. So, am I, am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, you can only talk about it during the winter. Yeah, so they can only talk about it uh, during the winter, so we had to wait for that time to come around, and then, you know, we could talk a little bit more. So, um, you know, not only Dizzy, but some of her relatives uh, spoke with me a little bit, you know, because I, I didn't want to screw it up, you know, didn't want to get it wrong, so. Um, and then I went up to the Navajo Nation as well and uh, to scout around for the setting. And uh, if you look at the cover of Tricked, um, right behind Atticus's right shoulder, there's like this little shadow, and uh, they put a, a book quote uh, on top of it. But that shadow is the silhouette of these stand, sandstone uh, uh, formations uh, on the Navajo Nation. I took that picture. I was very proud that they took, they put my picture on the cover, <laughs> and no one even knows because it's just a blog with a quote on top of it. Now, damn it. <laughs> But, uh, but I, I described the, you know, the, the sandstone formations that look like shark fins rising out of the sand, and, and those really exist, they're, they're there, and I went and scouted down you know, where everything would happen. 
um, and uh, you know where the skinwalkers would appear, etc. And it's beautiful, honestly, you guys. You go down there and uh, hidden from you know if you're just driving along the highway, you know driving through the reservation, which is what most people do. You don't, you don't realize the incredible beauty that's lying down inside of those canyons um, that get cut by flash floods. And they've got these pastures down there and sheep, you know. We drove down in there and uh, you know, we rented this you know, four-wheel drive vehicle. We're driving down in there. We come around this corner. It's like, here's a whole flock of sheep down there and a dude on a horse watching him. He's like, hey. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it is, and then they have they have the water sources marked on the on the sandstone and stuff like that. They know where all the springs are, etc. So there's this whole lush world out there in the Navajo Nation that most people have no idea exists, and uh, and, and and I think it's fabulous. I, I love that it's hidden and that we don't know about it, and that they're continuing to live their best life. You know, so. Very long answer. Sorry. No, that's good, but that does take the rest of our time. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. An hour and a half. Where else can we find you? Okay. Um, I actually have not even looked at my schedule <laughs> for tomorrow or Sunday, but I have stuff going on and it should be in the program. You can also go to my website and on my blog I have a, a entry called uh, Levin Getting and PHXCC, and it has my schedule for tomorrow and Sunday on there. And so uh, please come by and say hello to me if you'd like to come say hi now. You want me to sign anything? Heck yes. I'll do that. We can take a selfie. I'll have a good old time. And, I, and thank you guys so much for reading and for coming to see me tonight. And uh, you know, always feel free to say hi to me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Okay? All right. Bye. -bye.